Paul, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. okay. So thank you for coming everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Silvermeyer. Like um, Joel said, Paul and I are both at Marymount University. Um, I run the Open Educational Resources Initiative um, and I also do assessment from the library. So I'm gonna be speaking from those perspectives primarily. Hall runs outreach and access services, so she's going to speak primarily from those perspectives. However, we're both liaisons to academic programs as well, so we'll try to add in that perspective. Um, basically, we'll wear all the hats and we will try to change between the hats nimbly. So I wanted to start with a quick overview of our session today. We're going to start, I'm going to start by talking about the textbook affordability context nationally and then zone in on the textbook affordability context at Marymount. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Hall and she's going to talk to you about the textbook reserve program at Marymount. Um, she's going to include our timeline, the marketing and outreach that she's done. I'll talk about data and impact and return on investment. And Hall's going to jump back in and talk about um, the pandemic. So I'll begin with the national context. As you probably know, Americans collectively owe over a trillion dollars in student loans. According to the College Board, the average borrower carries a debt load of about 28,000, just over 28,000. And most of that burden is carried by millennials and Gen Z who make up the majority of college students now. Textbook costs are included in those numbers. The average student, again, according to the College Board, is told to budget about 1200 per year for textbooks. So we know that many students, especially those who are, who are in the most vulnerable demographics, don't graduate in four years. So if they're paying with loans and actually buying their books, they could end up owing upwards of five grand in loans just for books if they buy them. We also know that students often opt not to purchase the book. Most of them do so to save money, knowing that they'll compromise their learning and their grade. The image on the slide is from the US Student Perg's most recent report on the broken textbook market, which came out very recently. I highly recommend it. And it represents how many students from their sample opted out of purchasing or renting their textbooks due to cost, 63%. For more insight into the national textbook affordability conversation, I highly recommend checking out the hashtags real college and the hashtag textbook broke. You don't have to have a Twitter account to look at those. You can just um, Google them. I, find, I follow them personally and I find it really instructive. Now a little bit about the context at Marymount. Marymount students are told to budget $1,000 per year for textbooks, so just under the national average. So over four years, again, not all of our students graduate in four years. That would be about $4,000, um, which is about a seventh of the amount, uh, of the average amount of student debt in Virginia. So were the student debt in Virginia is just below the national average as well. I can't remember the, the number off the top of my head, but it's very close to the national average. So a little bit more about the Marymount student body. Um, I'm worth, and when I say student body, I'm, I, we chose to focus primarily on the um, undergraduate student body because they um, tend to be the heaviest users of this program and we have more undergrads than grads at Marymount. So our student, our undergrad student body is a majority minority, <laughs> majority minority student body. It's majority female, it's two thirds commuter, and it's 25% Pell eligible. So just as a personal aside, I went to school on Pell grants as an undergrad. So I have firsthand experience trying to stretch financial aid and student wages to cover educational expenses. I definitely cut corners where I could. I got by without textbooks um, and these issues are very close to my heart. So if we look at our student body from an intersectional perspective, we can see that our students are more likely to experience financial pressure 
while they're in college just because of who they are and the way that our society is structured. Um, we also have reports from professors saying that students aren't doing their reading because they don't have access to the textbooks. We've been hearing that for a long time. So we know that textbook cost is a barrier to student success at our campus. It's aligned with national trends in that way. Marymount University um, touts our student, our diverse student body. We're very proud of how diverse our student body is and the library is proud to serve them and we wanted to step up to meet their needs. So issues of educational equity, um, in my opinion, have never been clearer than they are right now. Um, we're all living through um, a very, uh, a time where I think the social stratification is very stark. Um, I'm gonna now pass the virtual mic to Hall, who's gonna tell you about how the library stepped up to address textbook affordability at Marymount Library. Let me switch slides for you, Hall. Thank you, Janice. So now we're kind of going to dive into our multi-pronged textbook affordability initiative. And I do wanna talk about a precursor. So we kind of had something that many of you might have. So in the sense that if we actually had the textbooks prior to implementing this program, we would put those on reserve. So we didn't intentionally buy these textbooks. It's just like, oh, we noticed that this book is gonna be used for this class. We would try to put those on reserve on possible. So just to give you kind of a precursor number wise, we had about 189 quote unquote textbooks on reserve with 417 checkouts. And then for course reserves, we had 147 items supporting 56 courses. So we really kind of try to supplement with course reserves as we could. And so with that in mind and with affordability, we had the open educational resource team and a couple of components. So they assembled to address the textbook affordability in spring of 2017. And Janice has actually been the team coordinator for that team and I'm on it as well. And then we had another component, which was we wanted to create a comprehensive text comprehensive textbook reserve program in addition to the OER. Hall, I just realized, can you say a little bit more about the comprehensiveness? So um, what do we, how many textbooks do we buy? How do we buy them? I realize that we don't have that in our slides. <laughs> um, no, we have, we have some of that later on, I think. Just meaning that, oh, I mean, meaning that we, we buy a textbook for every class. Yes, that yes. is well, that's very true, thank you. <laughs> So our comprehensive textbook program that we created is we support every single class and any required textbook we now buy. Thank you, Janice. Sorry. My bad. Okay. So how did this all begin? So the OER team assembled in spring. We wanted to create this initiative. So it really started happening in summer of 2017. And so that is when we started drafting a pilot phase. So we began to brainstorm and collaborate on a textbook reserves program that would support every single course and buy all those textbooks. So over the summer, we started developing textbook program procedures. And this is a collaboration between collection services, access services, and the librarians that serve as faculty liaisons, as well as a textbook reserve program policy. So how would it even work? What if you lost a textbook? Um, a lot of textbooks are worth more than the $80 that we have uh, kind of set aside in the WLC standard as well as a workflow. So who would even work on this? We would need somebody from acquisitions who's actually on this. I see you, Linda Greenland. And also somebody um, from Access as well to maintain the pilot and then the eventual program. And so how that even came across was a textbook reserve spreadsheet, which we'll show you in the next slide. And this is a lot of iterations later, um, finding out what kind of worked for that workflow. And then purchasing textbooks as we need them by semester to distribute cost. So there obviously was a front cost, a heavy uh, front cost for the first semester. And then it's definitely dwindled down ever since, since a lot of the same courses use the same textbook. And so then we began adding these textbooks to our collection. And so this is just kind of how that workflow with the spreadsheet looks like. I actually use one of Janice's areas, um, criminal justice. And so we would hyperlink. So we actually share this with our student workers too. Um, so view only with the student workers and then Whenever somebody comes to the desk, you know, usually if it's more than, can I have the blue textbook? Uh, we can say what class is it for, what instructor, we can find it, the hyperlinks in the, in the spreadsheets and they can find it on this textbook reserves. And then I wanted to find a program that has um, the location on it. So criminal justice 
some classes are taught at, taught at our Boston location and some classes are taught at the main location. And you can see sometimes we have it on both um, as well. So that's kind of how this looks. And so we launched the pilot in fall 2017. We finalized the procedures and policy. Those also changed several times. We implemented, so we implemented this new pilot. In the spring, it was successful in the fall. In the spring, we continued the pilot. And then in the summer, we kind of looked back on the year and thought, well, how could we have improved? What could we do? And so then officially in fall 2018, this became uh, just a permanent part of our services. We continue to offer the textbook reserves. So that was kind of just the timeline. And this is how we really marketed and, re and um, conducted outreach on this. So when we initially launched this, it was a huge campaign. We had flyers, we had social media posts, and then we also uh, communicate with our liaisons. So we have a faculty liaison newsletter that goes out every spring, fall, and summer. And so we started adding that, adding information on that. And so then, and it was, it was a pretty huge campaign. And then post fall 2017, it's just kind of become standard in every outreach or outward facing thing we do. So it's in the admissions tour when students give tours on campus to prospective students. It's continually in our liaison newsletters, mainly because we need faculty to submit uh, their textbooks, which they don't often do on time like we would like. It's continual in our social media posts, especially when gearing up for finals or midterms. It's in all our orientations, new student, grad, new staff, new faculty. It's in our annual library carnival where students can like literally go and find like find their textbook. And also in our new hire flyers that we give out too. And so I have a couple of examples of what we did on the next two slides. So this was our initial launch campaign uh, and it got a lot of positive feedback. And also my, when I first had a dog, my dog ate a George Mason book so I can empathize. Um, and so this is kind of how our flyers were. They were on the back of the toilet stalls. They were all over campus. They were all over social media. And then this is the section that we put on our new faculty flyer. So that way they're just automatically aware. And then if they have textbook information or they, you know, were worried that maybe a textbook was going to be too expensive, which is a different conversation or anything like that, they're made aware of this as well. So now we're going to switch over to back to Janice for measuring success. Okay, back to me. So from an assessment perspective, we wanted to be as proactive as possible since this program required us to use our collection budget in a new way. So I'm sure like many of your collections, we did not traditionally buy textbooks. In fact, we explicitly stated that we didn't buy textbooks even though we ended up with some in our collection, wink, wink. Some of us uh, may have been doing this a little early. So um, we, for our quantitative measures, we, um, we capture use. So we quantify use just by the number of checkouts per semester. We thought about trying to do number of unique checkouts per semester, but we decided that we wanted to keep it a little simpler. Is that right, Hall? Yeah, okay. Hall's the expert on that. Um, we also have been monitoring our door counts. So we've seen, although we can't, um, we can't necessarily specify causation here, we have seen a correlation with the traffic increase since we've started this program. Um, and then for qualitative measures, we've captured survey data from student and faculty facing surveys. Our faculty facing question, we, um, we run that survey every two years. So the first year um, we were really concerned with awareness of the program. Um, Hall does an outstanding job with outreach and marketing, but we, we, and, but we also know that can only get us so far. Faculty are by far the most powerful conduit for um, conveying a message to students. So we really needed that to make sure that they knew that this was available so that they could point their students to the library, especially, again, those most vulnerable students. Um, we also have been monitoring the number of questions related to textbooks 
textbook reserves we get at the reference desk and at the circulation desk, both in person and over chat. And that has given us a lot of good insight into um, some of the ways that we might marketing our, market our program in the future, um, some things that maybe we weren't communicating clearly, not from a marketing perspective, but from a policy perspective. It gives us all sorts of good data. Um, and it also has been a really great training opportunity, like a cross-training opportunity for us um, in at the reference desk and at the circulation desk. Our students, our, our um, student staff, because they are um, primarily well, not primarily, they're often the ones that are that are um, staffing the circulation desk. They have really um, become the public face of this program. And I think that's been um, a positive experience for them. Although Hall can speak more um, eloquently to that because that is her area. Um, so now I wanna move on to data and impact. So, so far since um, fall of 2017 through March 2020, obviously um, the pandemic period is going to look a little bit different and Hall's going to touch on that. Our textbooks have been checked out over 10,000 times, which is huge for us. We're a very small school and we're a small library. So um, this, is, this, is, this is big numbers for us. Um, the most popular or most checked out textbooks are a really interesting data point for us. So um, the in spring of 2019, the most popular or most commonly checked out textbook was um, a textbook called On Course for Seminar 101, which at first glance doesn't really look that interesting. But if I give you the context, I think you'll see that um, it's actually, it's given us a really actionable um, textbook affordability kind of learning moment. So, Seminar 101 is a class that students who are ac on academic prob probation have to take. So these are typically some of our most vulnerable students and you can bet that the last thing that they want to spend $60 for is a textbook for a class that they have to take because they're on academic probation. So this was an area where I worked with the course manager to replace this textbook with an OER. Um, I have anecdotal data that the students provide, greatly prefer the free materials and have received lots of positive feedback from the faculty who teach it, who felt that the book wasn't actually aligned with the student needs in the first place. So this is a perfect example of the two components of our textbook affordability program working together. The second, second most popular text, which is a psych 300 level class book, is a class that in my role as the psych liaison, um, I might target in the future for OER conversion. I've been in the psych, I'm very fortunate in that the, um, the psychology department has been really, really receptive um, to working on incorporating open educational resources into their curricula. And I think that this would be um, a really prime example of that. So collecting this type of data has um, helped me open conversations with my faculty and I know it's done the same for our other liaisons. So here's a visualization of the circulation data. As you can see, it's increased each semester at both of our library locations. So the lighter blue is our main location and then the darker blue is our Boston location. Um, and you can see that this big, we have this big jump in fall of 2019 at Boston. And that was um, because Marymount decided to move more classes to our Boston Center. So we can see that these textbook use is kind of following them across um, across the campus to our other center, which we thought was really interesting. And we, again, although we can't um, identify as identify it as a causative factor, we noticed that the foot traffic at that library location increased as well. So just good, um, good data for us, especially when we look at the hours that were open at each location, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm going to transition back to Hall, who's going to talk more about the specifics of this. Yes. So we're going to kind of transition back to kind of how the reserve program looks. And so as I mentioned previously, we had 189 in the 15-16 year quote unquote on textbook reserve with 417 checkouts. 
And last year we had 769 items with over 4,000 checkouts. And so the course reserve has uh, significantly dropped off in number of courses, but mainly the items. And you know, a lot of times professors wanna just go ahead and put their like a copy of the textbook on reserve for their students. So this really helps supplement the need for course reserves. Um, and so it also helped us free up some space to hold the reserves. And so then now I'm going to talk about the library benefits and opportunities. It's been interesting and I think Janice will agree to see the different opportunities and benefits this has uh, caused. So first is circulation increase. I don't know if your library is like ours, but our circulation isn't necessarily the highest uh, usage. And so from 2016 to 2017, we had 8,337 checkouts and that is MU items to MU students, because I know we have the CLS and things like that. But then in 2018 to 19, we had almost 12,000 checkouts, and that is exclusively pretty much the uh, textbooks, some laptops too, but mainly the, tech, the textbooks. And then we've had more connection with our teaching faculty, so we might email them like, hi, what textbook are you using for this class? We haven't seen it come through the system yet, things like that, but then that gets we can now know our faculty better, as well as kind of know what courses and like the curriculum that they're de developing for their courses and it kind of bridges that organic relationship. And it's also led to more discussion on open ed and textbook affordability, which is really essential because they kind of go hand in hand, especially when it comes to our online course catalog. So it was a little frustrating for our staff and it still is. So there is no designation in our online course catalog when something does not require a textbook. It just says to be determined. So now we're having these conversations like, could we start promoting a zero cost course or that they're using open educational resources or they don't need a textbook. So that way the students know, but also we know, so we're not continually trying to see if that course has added a textbook. And it's really helped connect us with our student body. My, one of my favorite memories of this program is our student body president was giving a tour to to uh, prospective students and he was like, I'm gonna buy my textbooks. I use, I just use the library, come in and study and then I can just go back to my dorm and hang out and to have that buy-in from uh, different organizations on campus, especially the body president was really fun to hear. And then also connection with our other regional libraries um, as well. And so now we're gonna talk about, there's been opportunities, right? But there's always stumbling blocks as well. So we can be your guinea pigs. So the, the one of the main ones is the workflow. So who would own this? It's such a collaboration between uh, collections and acquisition as well as access. And so determining who would do that. And we have two staff members who really work awesome together, Jason and Linda, who Linda orders, Jason, you know, they both update the spreadsheet then Jason takes care of it for the circulation side. <clears throat> But as I mentioned, our internal systems. So they don't always uh, communicate with each other well. And so that has been an issue, but it's also led to further conversations and dialogue on how we can best improve our systems. Purchasing, I'm glad we did this a few years ago. Uh, budgets are a little bit tighter now, especially with the uncertainty with the incoming class of 2020. So it is an investment at the beginning, but it does go down over time. And, but then also when to buy an ebook and print. Like hindsight's 2020, we wish all our textbooks were ebooks before this pandemic, which I'll get into next. But there's also often a cost difference if you buy this ebook or if you buy it in print. And then time. So the two staff members who work, uh, Jason, who works with me, he devotes about eight to 10 hours a week, um, depending on what time it is in the semester. And he's also um, does helps me with outreach as well. So it does take time. <clears throat> And now the fun part. So COVID-19, which we're all dealing with in different ways. So how would this program work during COVID-19? First, we had to be flexible and create a new workflow. So we created a new spreadsheet, but this spreadsheet was now just tracking scan requests. So copyright was a little bit lax in the spring with open ed and, and the vast change that occurred very quickly. But, and I looked and we had over 160 scan requests from faculty requesting like, hey, could you scan this chapter? The students usually use the textbook from 30 different programs or departments at, um, at the university. So uh, thank you to the two staff members that we had on campus and the student workers who, would, who mitigated all that. And then 
additional outreach. So we emailed right when we saw that we were going to go online for the rest of the semester. Well, first it was two weeks. So we reached out to all our liaison faculty and said, we will help you uh, cover the, for the next two weeks if you need any textbook scans. And then it was the rest of the semester. And then it was the summer. And then so now we're trying to reevaluate how how we will prepare for fall. We're trying to buy out ebooks, which again can be more expensive. But on a brighter note, we also have been having a lot of OER conversations. So faculty realized, hey, teaching with a traditional textbook when all of a sudden you have to switch online isn't the best uh, system. So Janice held an OER um, workshop in May and we had over 40 attended and she can speak more to that if there are questions, but it was significantly more than we have had on, on a workshop level like that. Um, a general conversation, we've had more people, but on a workshop, it was pretty high. And so that's just textbooks in two years in a nutshell. And so now we'll take questions. And I do wanna say if you are interested in any of our policy and procedures, uh, we will send those to you and you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All right. I see we have a couple of questions in the chat. So how do you handle the textbook with security code? Do you mean the like title tape? I think that they mean the um, access codes. Oh, that is a really good question. Uh, we, we, we uh, remove the access code. So students might have to buy that book or um, things like that. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, access code. Yeah, so fortunately, a lot of um, access codes can be purchased separately. So our, I mean, while we would love to provide both the textbook and the access code, um, they won't sell, as you probably know, uh, textbook vendors will not sell that to an institution um, because they're single user only. So we haven't found um, a good way other than saying we can this is what we can provide you we wish we could do everything but if you need the access code for your class that has to be purchased separately um, we it really varies I think our we we're very fortunate to have a body of teaching faculty who are fairly cost conscious because we um, because of our student demographic so I don't know if the access code use as is as high as it is on other campuses, which is not to say that we don't use them, but um, I don't know what the prevalence is. Paul, do you have anything else to say on that? Not for that question. For how okay. to get the buy-in from faculty, that, that was actually something I had in my notes for the stumbling blocks, which that actually wasn't one. Uh, the faculty have been very receptive to this. And I actually think during the current pandemic, they've been even more so because I don't think they necessarily realized how many students might actually use our textbook. So we got a ton of emails from faculty being like, my student can't doesn't have their textbook. Um, can you please help us with this? And things like that. Uh, we did have one, we've, I, to my knowledge, we've only had one like negative incident and it was a very specific uh, translated edition of a philosophy text and we accidentally got the wrong ISBN. And but other than that, do you have anything to add, Janine? Yeah, I think that um, a, because we had heard through various channels from our faculty that they they were having so many issues with their students not buying the textbooks or not doing the reading anyways that I think it was a logical next step for our campus. So and I've seen a lot of that in the OER conversations. That's that's one of the things I think that faculty are most interested in mitigating and they've my faculty who have seen who have adopted OER, I think, have been um, have been pleasantly surprised with seeing the way that their students engage with those resources as opposed to a traditional commercial textbook. So our next question. Do you work with the Marymount Bookstore for textbooks requests submitted there or work exclusively between liaisons and faculty to determine titles? That's an interesting question. Um, and I think Hall and I can both speak to that. I'll let Hall kick that off. So we, it's, when we were talking about internal systems, it's 
it's interesting. So the way it the way it works, quote unquote, at Marymount is faculty submit to their admin who submit to the bookstore or that system. And then it connects to our online catalog. And so we search both. Um, if that's the question, I will say when it came to the first time we were implementing this in the fall, because it had taken us a while to get the procedures, we had to buy a lot of the textbooks actually from the bookstore because um, w through Gobi or things that wouldn't have given us, we needed it like now. <laughs> yeah, and another piece that I think has been interesting for us is that, so that first year that we did this, we still had a physical bookstore on campus. And then by the second semester, I think that we did it, we had um, changed our vendor model and we now have a spirit store on campus and an online bookstore. So um, in some ways that has changed our purchase, the, the way that we purchase. And we, we, that first year, like Hall said, we tried to purchase, we were where we, we tried to be proactive in including the bookstore in this conversation and we tried to purchase from them. And then the second year, um, we didn't because it changed and our bookstore has been uh, challenged, I think, to uh, their inventory has been really, they've, they've just been, it's just kind of a mess. Um, so we are able to kind of intercept that data from our system um, and then we supplement when we need to as liaisons um, through reaching out to our faculty for textbook information so it's a it's very much a team effort um, let's see what was that I think there was a question I think next is Patrick and Patrick yes I can, we can find that information Unless, Janice, you know it off the top of your head. Um, I don't know it off the top of our head. I know that it's not nearly what, as much as you might think because, again, our faculty are, sorry, there was a gnat, um, are fairly cost conscious and they intentionally delay updating to the newest edition of their book often. So we haven't cycled through as many additions as you might think and again we purchase so we purchase on a semester by semester basis so in order to spread that cost out and Megan who is Megan Burke who is um, in attendance is on the collection side of things she might have more insight into um, the percentage of the collections budget that we have spent on textbook in the past it it varies a lot semester to semester and that kind of answered Jeffrey's question as well so um, I think maybe or I can speak more to it if there if we notice there's a newer edition or it actually is usually the the opposite for us um, like usually our faculty are using like three or four editions ago. So we do it for both ways. If there is, if, there, if we've used an older edition, but there's a newer edition or they um, use a newer edition and we have an older edition, we just have that conversation. And sometimes they're like, that one's fine. Or sometimes they're like, there's actually been some updates. Can we order the new one? But I would say for that one, it's usually like, hey, did you realize there's a 15th edition and you're using the ninth? <laughs> Um, so I see a question from John. Are you planning to support circulation of print textbooks during the fall or is the plan to root all access of these e books to e-reserve and digitization? That's a, again, a very timely question. Um, at this point, Marymount has issued a statement saying that they intend to be open in the fall. Obviously that is subject to change. Um, as, as our boss Allison likes to say, it's like walking on sand the landscape looks different every day so at this point um we are planning to support in-person circulation but um we'll see hall can probably speak to that more than i can yes we we are in conversation based on if we're having face-to-face -face classes we're going to have some kind of system that's tbd in place to to circulate these textbooks and Vicki, who's on this call as well, and I have talked about it because it's like, do we provide gloves? Do But the answer is if we're in person, we're with proper distancing and, and, and uh, safety, we do plan to 
support the circulation of print textbooks. Another thing I wanted to add in reference to Jeffrey Popovich's question. So we did intentionally write something into our purchasing policy about how often we would upgrade if we upgrade, meaning upgrading um, to the newest edition um, in case the faculty were insistent on upgrading every time a new edition came out. And I, and fortunately for us, that has pretty much been a non-issue because again, our faculty um, are mostly cost conscious and um, they don't, they don't jump to the newest edition right away in most cases. And John, thank you for the comment about our encouraging numbers. And then have we had any feedback from patrons about how they would like to see the program go? That's interesting. I don't know if we've ever phrased it like that because to, Jan to Janice and I were like, we want it to shrink. We want, we want everybody to go to more open educational and less textbook based, but maybe it could evolve into something. Uh, yeah. Different. Yeah. That's, I mean, we've definitely, I think our students, Sometimes as, as with any of the, as with the course reserves as well, I think when they come in and they're trying to, especially freshmen, they, they, I think they come in not, not having any experience with reserves. And so they're like, two hours, what, what am I supposed to do for two hours? And then they realize, oh, okay, I can just scan it. I can take pictures with my phone. I don't have to sit here for two hours. So I think the student feedback with reserves is always like, well, I'd rather have this for the whole semester. And of, of course we would love to accommodate that, but, but we can't. I think we also, I think we've gotten some feedback about trying to prioritize eBooks, which we are actively doing. Um, as, as I'm sure any of you know who do purchasing, it's more often the case than not that the e-textbook is not available as an institutional copy. Um, so we, the yeah, the availability of e-textbooks has been limited, but we do buy them um, every time we can, especially for our um, grad courses. We have about four minutes left. Are there any, um, any last questions that we can answer for you? Ooh, good question, Jeffrey. If it's only a single user instead of multiple, do you purchase it or a print text? I think in that case, we would probably purchase, purchase a print text because we could make, in the event that we had to do scans, this would be more readily available, but I don't know, Hall, what do you think? I think what we normally do is we actually turn off, and Linda or Megan, please jump in. I think we actually turn off the option to uh, download it, so it's only read only, and so that yes, that's right. It um, that way it's still accessible to to students. Jeffrey, you've got all the good questions. And Megan says, and we put the textbooks on a reserve list so they show up in our reserve search scope. Yes, that's an, that's, wow, we totally neglected to include um, the work that Megan has done on the cataloging side. I'm sorry, Megan, and your team um, to make these things really findable in the collection. Um, she has done an outstanding job with that. And if, if there are questions about that, she's, um, a great resource on working with Alma to um, make make our course reserves and text reserve textbooks reserves um, readily findable. Sorry, Megan, I can't believe that we're so dumb. Anything else? Thank you, Celia. Thank you. 
If you have any questions, um, I would like to think our emails are on the send out to this invitation, but we will share our policy, our procedures, um, anything that you want if you're interested in adopting this. Yeah, we would be very happy to help. It's um, It's been really encouraged. We've gotten so much positive feedback from our students that Hall and I were just musing when we were practicing this morning at we're like, we feel proud of this work. It's good. It's a nice thing to feel good about right now. Um, so it's, it's, it was a lot of work, but it's been very worthwhile. Um, so thank you for coming, everyone. And special shout out to a few of our team members who are here that made this possible, specifically Linda Greenland, who works on the acquisition side and is just so patient. Um, Megan Burke, who has done the cataloging. I see Linda Todd here. I see Caroline. Um, it's really, it's really been just a phenomenal team and effort. Vicky, and Vicki, who uh, is our And Vicki, yes. Yes. She's going to deal with all the reserves at Boston, so thank you. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> all right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Take thank care. You for coming.